Okay, right, we'll carry on. Um, I think those who are going to be here are here, and uh, we should get on, otherwise we'll all be running later still. Um, okay, I'd like to introduce Thomas Stalzer, who um, I also asked some of his uh, friends and acquaintances uh, what they could tell me, dish any dirt on. Unfortunately, they only said nice things like uh, uh, deep technical expertise, saving projects, etc. So I can't use any of that, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, you know, yesterday we were, we were uh, shown, if, in physical e-toys, we were shown an interface to uh, driving robots. Well, Thomas is going to talk about uh, interfaces to driving much more interesting machines, like washing machines. Well, actually, no, that's not really the purpose, although he does do that. He's going to talk on slightly, slightly more interesting toys than washing machines. So, uh, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. My name is Thomas Stalzer. I hope everybody is wake up and had some coffee now. Did everybody have a coffee? No? Oh, okay, well, too bad. Have to wait for the next break. Okay, um, what I'm going to talk about is um, system integration and how to get different kind of system talk to small talk. Am I talking okay? Is my voice okay? Loud enough? Okay, very well. Uh, first of all, let me tell you a little bit where I come from. To my surprise, I found out yesterday that I've been already working for about 23 years with Smalltalk. I started with Smalltalk in 88. Uh, back then, I was still working for IBM, but then I switched over to a strange little company in California called Enfin Software. I don't know if anybody still knows Enfin. And um, that evolved eventually into Object Studio from Syncom right now. Um, back in about, uh, was it 96, 95? 95, 96, I got um, a copy of Visual Age Smalltalk 1.0. I still got a box at home. I found, I found that one also yesterday. And that's when we switched over to the, the IBM flavor and did some project development for banks and insurances. We founded the Object Dynamic Software Corporation in Germany. And uh, one of the things we developed were the phaser frameworks, which are a application framework set of tools and, um, well, one of the major things we worked on at that point were distributed models. Distributed models means that you have a model not running in one VM, but running on multiple VMs distributed in, in a network. In 2009, uh, that had also something to do with some personal things. I moved to Mallorca, not far from here, about um, 150 kilometers south from here in the Mediterranean Sea. I've been living there for 13 years now. And well, in 2009, we formed uh, the Natural Software and Services, SL. And uh, that company focuses mainly on using the phase of frameworks and using the technology to interface into home automation protocols like KNX, uh, White Goods, and so on. So basically, we have two companies, two product lines. Uh, the German company focusing on consulting and project development, and the Spanish company focusing on home automation, home automation integration. <coughs> so uh, that's one of the things I like to show. <laughs> um, those are a couple of references, a couple of companies we've been working for where we're doing projects. Uh, the interesting one actually is on the lower half, it's Janus, it's a joint venture from uh, an insurance in Germany and financing company Siemens, which are trying to get the home automation stuff on a wide, well, on a broad basis into for, for customers. <coughs> so a little bit of the, of the past. Um, in two, in back in 2000, that's 11 years ago, it's time flies. Uh, in 2000, uh, we had a requirement. We were working at that time for an insurance company in Germany, and we did a uh, system that was used to manage existing contracts and getting new contracts and doing the yearly end calculations and new calculations, doing all the forms and everything. And we had a whole a giant object model, a couple thousand classes, a business object model with a couple thousand classes. Uh, we got nice GUI on it. We got a really nice rule engine in there. So any change you made was validated and you got messages back and you had the possibility to get things like, uh, well, the valid values for this attribute is from two. 
And um, so they said, okay, well, let's take this um, fat client application and let's make a server application out of it and build a really nice front end in it, uh, for it in Java. So we had to access somehow from Java the Smalltalk um, back end. And uh, it wasn't supposed to be any, f uh, well, fat client application, but rather a server-based application. So we implemented that. We implemented a facade-based access to Smalltalk. On the next files, I'm getting into it, what I mean by that. And over the years, we used the same technology, the same protocols, the same mechanisms to build access for, well, Smalltalk clients, um, for C-sharp clients, and also for ActionScript, uh, which is the language of Flash in, uh, in, in browsers. So the application we were, we were looking at, where we were supposed to build a new kind of front end to, uh, was really a complex architecture. I mean, any of those who, who have been working for insurances know what kind of, well, um, let's, what's the political correct term, uh, technology challenged sometimes the environment can be. Um, in, in normal English, you would just say it's a plain mess. And uh, so you have hundreds of programs you have to call, different kind of protocols, all kinds of different systems. And what was really nice actually is that they had a model-driven approach that you had a nice big model and they used it to generate their COBOL and C code and well also imported the stuff into, into Smalltalk. What was really nice at that time, we had a, um, a rule engine implemented and we had a very small granu granularity uh, for the system. So any attribute change immediately gave you an okay or not okay if any rules were violated or not. And these rules you got messages about and, um, well, knew what you had to do. <coughs> so that kind of picture, I mean, everybody probably came across at uh, one point of application um, development. On the back-end side, we got some host systems like Six, COBOL, whatever. We got some databases like DB2. And actually, what we usually implement is a three-layered architecture. We do uh, divide into the so-called service, EUM. EUM stands for Enterprise Object Model or Business Object Model, and the GUI. And then you have some framework classes you build upon, and you specialize uh, your implementation for those three layers uh, below it. So that actually is the architecture of the, or the basic architecture of the rich client system we had. <coughs> so now the, the new requirement came that we had to turn that rich client application into an advanced, I wanted to put that in parentheses as well, uh, distributed application and build a Java front end and at that time use AWT and later on they were using Swing. Uh, we were to re reuse the existing application as much as possible uh, and especially none of the model should be changed because that had to be maintained in the future on the same code basis and all of the rules implemented, logic, everything had to be reused. So what were we facing with? Uh, we were having multiple parallel transaction now, uh, transactions now uh, because multiple instances of the object model could subside at the same time and being used by different kind of people and different kind of contexts. And then there was this little requirement that they had about, in the final version, 14,000 clients in roughly uh, 3,000 locations, and we were giving the limit to be using at the maximum seven servers for those people, which is not that easy. <laughs> So we ended up, oops, we ended up with an application architecture that looked similar to the one before. Uh, the one thing that we did is that that project GUI part, uh, we exchanged with a communication layer which was able to communicate with the Java front ends. The Java front ends were painting the GUI. Uh, you were entering the values. The values were being sent back to the, to the server. And actually the same logic as before, because starting from that point, everything was identical to the rich client application. So you see in parentheses down there, Smalltalk application, now it's server. On the previous foil, it was a rich client application. <coughs> the 
So we, we had the, the, um, the access from, to the object model from the, from the Java front end. We had a low granularity. That means we were, we were accessing the object model on a, on a method level, on an action level. I get to that also on the next part, I think. It had to be fast because we were not doing things like, okay, fill in the form completely and send it over at one time, have it validated and come back. Rather, we had uh, changing a value. It has to be sent to the server, put into the object model, the normal events firing, the normal rules checking, the results being packed, being sent back to the client. And it should be, as for the, for the client, the, the, the feel should be that in less than 200 milliseconds, the response should be there. And that in a distributed environment all over Germany, uh, even with things in Berchtesgaden with, with a 256 kilobit connection at that time. So we had to transmit small packets. Uh, we had to have compression in there. Um, we couldn't lose too much time over the network itself. And well, the one thing that was really getting to us in the beginning was the scalability that we had those 14,000 clients. A client meaning in that case computer running the Java front end. So these were a couple of the technologies. I, I pulled out a couple of the old foils that we had from, from back then. Um, one of the things we looked into was Java RMI. It was available. The problem with Java RMI was that it's relatively slow and it only supported Java data types. And we needed something that also told us, well, you get a fraction just for, um, well, um, accuracy for, for mathematical operations. And the overall granularity, it wasn't meant to be just a, a method sending. It was sort of like you pack a whole stuff, things together and send it over at one point. We were looking into Corba. Corba was available. It was also sort of like, a, well, an, an, an unwritten standard in the company we were working for at that time. But also, it was relatively slow. Um, only had the Corba data types, which didn't fulfill all the needs that we had. And again, the granularity was too large. What would have been interesting is using web services at that time, just having a socket open and sending XML over the line would have been really, really interesting. The only disadvantage they had is they weren't invented yet at that point. Um, and so we started developing the so-called phaser remote repository. It was very fast. Um, it was based, one of the algorithms that we had was on object loader, object swamper, uh, swapper on C base, uh, implemented in C in a C DLL, and that was really fast. So we used the same algorithm, the same possibilities to marshal objects on, on network streams. Um, because we developed it, it fit perfectly into our backend architecture. <laughs> so we had a really nice integration into the transactions and everything. Uh, the only disadvantage at that point was we had to develop the whole thing. <coughs> so that's uh, a picture of what we, we ended up doing. Those of you who know distributed small talk find a couple of similarities in here. Um, what happens is as soon as a object was being accessed from any external source, that object gets registered in what we call the repository. And the rep repository registers an object by a unique object ID, which is basically just the, the current time in milliseconds. And uh, if a external object, like a Java object, wants to access that object, it sort of creates a, a facade object for the Smalltalk object, and it knows the object ID it is talking to. So if a function call is made to the Java facade, that uh, function gets sent over as a message, and the default behavior of a small talk object is when it gets a message sent is that it looks for a method with the same name. If it doesn't find one, goes into the does, and does not understand handling. But if it finds a method by that name, it performs that method on itself. And the result is being sent back to the Java facade, which uh, tells the system this is the result. 
So basically everything the small talk object can do can be accessed from uh, in, the, in the Java facade. It's sort of like just a local pointer to, to, to a small talk object. <coughs> so those of you who know Visual H small talk and the parts architecture, um, the, in the visual age parts, you describe an object by, by telling what kind of actions that object has and what kind of attributes that that object has. And that's what we actually transform down to the, to the Java facade. An action is a, basically a method and an action may change other attributes or may change attributes. An attribute itself, if it is changed through the public interface, it may invalidate derived attributes, so I make a change to one attribute and that enforces a change to a different one. And also for the Java facade, an attribute is a cache for the server value. So if you call the getter five times, only on the first time a call to the server is made, on the subsequent ones the, uh, the cache values will be returned. And so the Java facade behaves just like a small talk object. I put that foil on here with, with cool stuff. Well, the, the, the fun things you could do is, uh, you know, you're just in Java and you send an inspect to an object. That was, well, in the beginning, it was in the pre-eclipse time. And uh, so if you send inspect to a facade, inspect gets sent over to the small talk object and the inspector for that object pops up. So if I make any change then on that, on that uh, Java facade, uh, on the Smalltalk object, well, I'm making changes in the running system. I can even code in the debugger uh, at that point and do changes in the system and have different results coming off every time I'm, I'm calling an object at that time. I can set breakpoints. I can develop in the Smalltalk debugger from my, my Java facade. So at that time, the Java developers were really going like, wow, this is cool stuff. Um, one of the things I'm, um, with, the, with the inspector, one of the things that, well, okay, I'm going to come to that on the next, next files because I think it's even on the, yeah, well, it's going to come on the next couple of files. I'm going to tell you some things about the inspector, which was really, which, which is really cool about it. Uh, so once we had the first implementation, everybody was going, well, how does this scale up and uh, can you do some tests on it? So we did extensive tests on how the whole system was performing. The major issue for us is network latency. That means uh, how long does it take for a certain data packet for the first bits and bytes to arrive at my de destination? And that was actually our biggest issue because if we have a network latency of uh, let's say 150 milliseconds from the client to the server, it's very hard to get performance in the 100 millisecond range because you're losing already more on the network. So um, that was actually our biggest issue and we had to tweak some things on the network in order to get the performance up. One of the nice things is that 95% of the messages being, over, uh, being sent over the network are in the one to two kilobyte uh, range so um, it's just one TCP IP, or one or two TCP IP blocks, and usually the systems are very fast with that. What was really interesting, what I was really worried about is because if we have those 14,000 clients on seven servers, we're going to have basically 2,000 clients uh, talking to one server. Um, by definition, we're going to have at least three open sockets uh, on the system for each client, so we're going to maintain 6,000 uh, 6, sockets parallel on the server, and it basically, well, it worked pretty good. It wasn't, wasn't uh, an, an, an issue. Well, at least most of the time not. We had, we had some nasty debugging at that time, too. <laughs> okay, that's the thing that I... Um, wanted to um, to talk about before on the on the inspector with the event propagation um, facades were being marked invalid if somebody else changes the, uh, a value on it on the server well okay well it was the requirement that the fa facades had to be marked uh, invalid if somebody else changes a value so that what we implemented was an event manager which 
on the client in Java which waited for events to happen on the server. So if a server object did a signal event or uh, notified the, the client that it had changed, something happened, the event manager would fire an, an event in the Java world and then update the desktop. So for example, if I was talking about the inspector, you just used Java, send an inspect to an object, you had on the Smalltalk side the inspector pop up, you changed an instance variable over there, that sent off an event which updated the GUI interface on the Java side again. And you could do that in a running system, in a running debugger, and the Java guys were just going like, wow, cool. <coughs> so how, how um, well, the way we do it um, was actually a little bit tricky. Uh, what we were doing is we were marking all the objects that were being used from the facades as read-only. So if an object is marked as read-only and I try to do a change in an instance variable through a method, through a direct assignment, through whatever, then uh, the, um, that object will fire an exception. And we tr uh, use that exception to say, okay, somebody changed that object, uh, compared to values if really a change happened, and if yes, we took the change anyway, but we also fired an event to all registered facades to inv invalidate their attribute value to say, listen, this isn't, isn't accurate anymore. And then if that client facade, for example, is connected to a GUI or whatever, the client facade says, okay, I need to reload myself and got the new values from the server then. <coughs> Another nice feature or nice, well, challenge was garbage collect. If you have a distributed um, object model being accessed all over the network, how do you know which objects you don't need anymore? Uh, and actually what we found out is that uh, it's basically garbage collect may be implemented as a side effect of event propagations. Um, all the remote objects were in a weak table in the remote repository. If, some, if nobody was accessing that object, that business object anymore, um, then the remote repository would detect that because that object would have been taken out of that weak table and then all the clients would have been notified that that object isn't valid anymore, well, it doesn't exist anymore. And we solved that through a special kind of event. <coughs> Another thing was if you performed an action on an object, you really didn't know from external what's really gonna happen. Uh, and that might have an effect on, on multiple objects. So what we all, what we did is, as soon as we performed an action, we invalidated in an facade automatically all attributes, and then we reloaded all the attributes in one go. So we just had one server call, but that one was a little bit bigger, but got us all the attribute information back. And the things that we also uh, load with attributes, um, we, we got type information, what it really was, because we needed that for the conversion to the Java types on the client. Uh, things like field length, uh, that's a feature from our frameworks. If an attribute is mapped to a database, then uh, the field length of the database field is stored with the object. And um, what we call an info text, where we have information like, it's sort of like the, the, the reverse of the rule engine, what are the limits of an object? The following values are valid. Like, for example, age has to be between 18 and 25. Huh? And also, any messages that come back from the uh, rule engine, like information warnings, errors, and so on. Uh, we also built a couple tools. You see those typical Smalltalk tools? That's a tool that a Smalltalk developer did. <laughs> I think you can always see the difference to, to other languages. Uh, that's basically the generator for, for facades. What we use is the visual age parts information to say, okay, what kind of instance variables are there? Well, actually, what kind of attributes are there? What kind of actions are there? What do you want uh, to have generated? And uh, then the system generates the, the, the Java code in the beginning, and nowadays also uh, C-sharp um, code. Okay, so this is now all the, the, the languages and subsystems that we are right now supporting. 
Um, we got uh, uh, Smalltalk as a client, we got C Sharp as a client, we got Java as a client, and ActionScript, uh, well, Flash as a client. Uh, for Smalltalk, we don't need any special facades. We have a generic facade which actually talks to the server object on, a, on the parts level. That, that was actually really simple. Uh, we don't need any tools because it's just one class on the client. And um, we are using it in the, in the product, the home automation product that we are well, building. It's called phaser control. We use the small talk, small talk communication for the phaser control editor when an editor speaks to a server. For the communication between the server and the registration server on our computers and also for things like distributed energy monitoring f of uh, multiple systems. I'm going to show you a couple pictures later on. Uh, the C-sharp front end, <coughs> we're using for Silverlight. Silverlight is Microsoft's answer to Flash. And also for, uh, we're building front ends for Microsoft Surface. I don't know if you know the Surface table. It's that multi-touch table where multiple people can work on. Um, Java, it's a Java client. We have that in a couple of the, well, actually in one, well, two insurance projects. And there's a company called Spirit. They have a test tool which is written in Java and is used to uh, test, well, do desktop application testing, GUI testing for, well, Java, uh, C++, and so on. And they asked us a year ago if we could build an interface to Smalltalk, and so we used a uh, remote repository technology in order for them to give access to the, to the GUI desktop in, in Smalltalk. Uh, for Flash, it's more or less like a, it's just a prototype, um, just to show off that we can do it but we haven't had yet the time or, well, not gonna really put some more effort in that uh, to build the, the tools that things are automatically generated. Oops. Just wanted to have one. So I already talked a little bit about uh, phaser control. That's, oh, we're on the time. Uh, I got, still got nine more minutes, that's good. <laughs> uh, phaser control itself was really a, a fun, project, pro uh, well, it's a fun product to, to, um, that we implemented. Uh, it was back in, in 2004, we started in renovating our kitchen. And we sort of have a kitchen technology contest with our neighbor, who has the best kitchen, who has the greatest tools, who has the best gadgets. So he is a little bit more design oriented and we are a little bit more technology oriented. So uh, we got all these nice uh, white goods that could be controllable over power line and the network, and we got the KNX bus for home automation in the kitchen, and all kind of things, RGB LEDs under the cooking island, really nice stuff. And at that point, I was going like, okay, now I want to integrate the whole thing. If I turn off on the, the hot plate, I want to have the lighting coming on above it. And when the dishwasher is finished, I want to have a message sent over to my media center that the dishwasher is done. And uh, so I looked into the system and I called up Siemens and I had this guy on the phone. He probably had a big beard and he was scratching it and he was going like, you know what, I think that's gonna be really expensive. And um, so I said, well, we are actually a software development company. And he said, well, no problem. If you sign a confidenti confidentiality agreement with us, I can send you all the protocols we are using. And I said, well, that, that sounds good. So he got me all the protocols and I said, okay, let's ho how are we gonna do the integration? And just used our normal software to integrate all kinds of things like the host six and everything, the technology we've been using for years in integrating all kinds of technolog technological subsystems we were using for home automation. And that's where we got phaser control out. And phaser control itself is now a product for, well, one and a half years. Mm. Get some nice customers. You saw the reference list in the beginning. Some really nice houses, bigger applications that are being using it. <coughs> so our goals with phaser control is actually that uh, we see it as an integration platform. That means making the best use of all the automation subsystems and 
the, the visualization part and getting the information to the, cu to the user that he can optimally use the system, get all the functionality, sees what he needs to know, work with, work with his house. <coughs> so that is now a typical phaser control uh, computer architecture, who's talking with whom. The major thing is the phaser control server down there. That's a machine that's gonna run 24-7 and uh, the browsers with flash on them, browsers with um, silver light, surface, and so on, uh, the phaser control editor, which is implemented in Smalltalk, and also when it comes to registration, the talk to the registration server also d works over the, the remote repository technology. If you have simple things in parentheses like HTML and stuff, that goes directly to the server, doesn't use our protocol, of course. <coughs> Um, that is basically the, the internal architecture of phaser control. Again, we have the three-layered architecture in the server. Again, the service business model presentation layer. The service layer in that case is modeling the real world. So if you have, for example, a KNX installation, you at some point you have a KNX to IP gateway and all the components with it, as you, well as, for example, for Miele at home, Surf at home, where you have a gateway and then the communication to the white goods. So you're implementing the real world on the service layer. You make that compatible, or we make that compatible on the logical layer. And then we just provide information for the, for the pre presentation front end. So those are just a couple of screen prints of uh, different kind of visualization systems. To the top left, we got the iPhone, uh, we got pictures of HTML. That microvis in there, that's a 55 millimeter Linux computer you can put into a normal, well, thing where you have a light switch. Uh, we got a Java 3D client, uh, Windows sidebar, whatever you need. That's a screen print of an application um, with it to monitor um, multiple buildings which are, well, logically connected because they have the same owner. And he wanted to know what is the energy consumption, uh, electricity con uh, consumption for all of those clients. And we provided an interface on Silverlight basis with drill down possibilities and so on. That's a screenshot of the Microsoft Surface desktop. Um, back there is the, a 3D model of a, of a little house that was turning, and you can touch it and the lights turn on, as they do in the real world in parallel, so it's not just a graphic demo, but you can just work on it and uh, control your rooms, control your lighting. Uh, you get video integration, so if somebody rings at the doorbell, you see that on the table. It's really funny, it's nice. Okay, good. Um, questions? I just rushed through the foils right now. Still got three minutes. <laughs> okay, um, then I just want to finish off with a little thing from Alan Kay. Best way to predict the future is to invent it. I think that's what we're doing here. And, uh, well, good things are simple. That's one of the things that we try to live by. Um, if you have a complex model, and after half a year of work, somebody looks at it and says, of course, that's the way it's gonna work, then you've done a good job. Mm -hmm. So. <coughs> okay, a little bit contact information from me. Um, so if you have any questions, things, suggestions, send me an email. <coughs>